Slide 1. This is Dr. Andrew Boston. Tuesday, July 30th, 2019, at ZOA's Zionist Organization of America National Headquarters in New York, uh, I gave a talk called The Rising Scourge of Islamic Anti-Semitism. The first slide uh, includes a photograph of, of uh, me and my host, uh, Mort Klein. Slide number two. I made some preliminary remarks uh, before the actual presentation began. Here are those remarks. Thanks to Mort Klein for his more than gracious introduction, and ZOA and Alan Jay in particular, for organizing and hosting this event. I don't do glib. Regardless, I have too much respect for this audience and the gravity of the problem I will be discussing to be glib. As a 1920s era French historian analyzing the Islamic ferment of his era observed, quote, the times are too serious for played out impressionism, unquote. And that's almost exclusively what we get each day from the chattering classes allegedly discussing Islam. One note of levity before I begin. The only Marxist philosopher I appreciate, Groucho, said, quote, beside a dog, a book is man's best friend. Inside a dog, it's too dark to read. For the next 30 minutes plus, I will cast light on subject matter utterly obscured by the darkness of cultural relativism and pure delusion. This is the fault, overwhelmingly, of non-Muslims. Slide 3. This slide is entitled Breaking the Self-Imposed Silence on Islam. It is, uh, uh, the centerpiece really is a striking uh, illustration by the wonderful uh, cartoonist Bosch Faustin, uh, who himself is a, uh, what I call a conscientious uh, objector to Islam, an ex-Albanian uh, Muslim. It includes a quote from the life of Muhammad, uh, one of the, the earliest, actually, uh, pious Muslim biography of Islam's prophet uh, by Ibn Ishaq. And it's a very straightforward description of the grisly scene that uh, Bash Faustin has depicted. Quote, then the apostle Muhammad went out to the trenches of Medina and dug, went out to the market of Medina and dug trenches in it. Then he sent for them and struck off their heads in those trenches as they were brought out to him in batches, unquote. Now, Maimonides, the great Jewish sage, of the Middle Ages, specifically condemned Muhammad's massacres of Jews and referred to him as Hamashuga, the madman. Some other important points about Maimonides and Islam. Maimonides experienced the mid-12th century Almohad Berber Muslim Jihad revival, accompanied by the slaughter of tens of thousands of Jews in Spain and North Africa, the survivors' forced conversion to Islam, and a Muslim inquisition imposed upon the forced Jewish converts. Maimonides wrote an epistle to the Jews of Yemen in response to their appeal to him during a period of identical jihad fanaticism in Yemen, slaughter, forced conversions, etc., approximately in the year 1172 CE. And, and here's an extract from Maimonides' epistle to the Jews of Yemen. Hamashuga, the madman, who added the further objective of procuring rule and submission and he, Muhammad, invented his well-known religion, Islam. Our sages instructed us to bear the prevarications and preposterousness of Ishmael in silence. We have acquiesced, both old and young, to inure ourselves to humiliation. At all this notwithstanding, we do not escape this continued maltreatment, which well-nigh crushes us, no matter how much we suffer and elect to remain at peace with them, they stir up strife and sedition. The fourth slide. This is a, one of a series of three slides uh, entitled, Ask the Anti-Semitism Experts. The first of those three slides. I pose two questions to a cadre of academics, independent scholars, theologians, journalists, and activists who opine in writing and speech about anti-Semitism generally and or within the Muslim world specifically when I had submitted the galleys for uh, my compendium on Islamic anti-Semitism entitled The Legacy of Islamic Anti-Semitism. This was about five months before the book was actually published. These were the two queries. 
Quote, in your opinion, would this quote below, which I will read to you, exemplify racial or at least ethnic anti-Semitism? Moreover, would you please hazard a guess as to where and when it was written based upon the contents? Uh, unquote. And here's, here's the quote that I sent to these experts. Quote, our people, the Muslims, observing thus the occupations of the Jews and the Christians, concluded that the religion of the Jews must compare unfavorably, as do their professions, and that their unbelief must be the foulest of all, since they are the filthiest of all nations. Why the Christians, ugly as they are, are physically less repulsive than the Jews may be explained by the fact that the Jews, by not intermarrying, have intensified the offensiveness of their features. Exotic elements have not mingled with them, neither have males of alien races had intercourse with their women, nor have their men cohabited with females of a foreign stock. The Jewish race, therefore, has been denied high mental qualities, sound physique, and superior lactation. The same results obtain when horses, camels, donkeys, and pigeons are inbred, unquote. The fifth slide, second in Ask the Anti-Semitism Experts. The experts respond. So here are the responses I got uh, to that query after having um, these experts analyze the quote. First, first response, quote, of course it's anti-Semitism of those vile racist stripe, which leads me to think it likely dates from the 19th century at the earliest. It also sounds like the sort of thing one would read in the anti-Semitic popular literature of the Edwardian period. So my guess would be somewhere between 1830 and the 1920s. Second response. I imagine this was written under the influence of modern theories of racial inferiority. Third response. If I had to hazard a guess, I would say this is from a sermon in a Gaza mosque this past Friday. Next response. Could be any mosque in the Muslim world or Nazi Germany if it weren't for the first line, definitely racial. Next response. How about current Wahhabi establishment? Next response. I have no idea who said it, but I'll hazard a guess just for sport. The Mufti of Jerusalem, circa 1940? Next response. Probably last week from one of the mullahs in the UK. Next response. Yes, racist to the point of being Nazi-like. I would say the Mufti of Jerusalem or some other Islamo-fascist or maybe contemporary Wahhabi. And the final response. It's the usual modern boilerplate from the Middle East. Sixth slide, third in our series, Ask the Anti-Semitism Experts. What the experts uh, did not know. The extract at the beginning of this query was written by Baghdad polymath al jahiz who died in 869, so in the middle of the, uh, the ninth century. Um, it's from an essay that Jahiz wrote that was commissioned by Abbasid Caliph al-Mutawakil, who died in 861, uh, as an anti-Christian polemic. So in other words, he was, uh, Jahiz was commissioned to write an anti-Christian polemic. Uh, Al-Jahiz and his caliph actually understood Muslim Jew hatred was more intense and widespread than anti-Christian hatred, and, and they wanted to rectify this, because after all, uh, the Islamdom and the Abbasid Caliphate uh, was not threatened by disempowered, scattered Jews. It was threatened by then existing and still strong uh, Christian uh, uh, Christian entities like the Byzantine Empire and the Armenian kingdoms. al jahiz cited two main reasons for this Muslim anti-Jewish animus. First and foremost, Quran 582. So that is the fifth surah or chapter 82nd verse. So that 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 is the standard way I'll be describing these verses. Uh, it'll be uh, the the chapter colon verse. Uh, the second factor that Jahiz cited was Muhammad's rancorous relationship uh, with the Jews of Medina. And we'll elaborate uh, on this in, in, in later in, on in the lecture. Um, so Quran 582 is repeatedly linked in classical and modern Quranic exercises, so commentaries, uh, to help us interpret the Quran, uh, to the central anti-Semitic motif of the Quran. The Jews are cursed for transgressing the will of Allah and condemned to permanent humiliation in the corporeal world and hellfire in the hereafter. The seventh slide. The seventh slide depicts Mort Klein 
and his landmark uh, for 1919, so April, April 9th of this year, congressional testimony, and, and it depicts Mort at the House Judiciary Committee hearings that day, uh, holding up uh, an image of global ADL survey data uh, showing a two- to three-fold excess prevalence of extreme anti-Semitism amongst Muslims. And we'll, I'll provide you with further explanation for that. Um, so this, this alone was, was breaking a taboo, just showing the data. Uh, mo much more profoundly was that uh, Mort correctly linked this hatred to the, to the Jew hatred incul inculcated by Sunni Islam's uh, Vatican equivalent and its last two papal equivalents, Grand Imam uh, Tantawi, who died in 2010, who happened to be the author of modern Sunni Islam's Quranic Kampf on the Jews, and we'll talk about that in a bit, uh, and the current sheikh of Al-Azhar, Ahmed Al-Tayeb, uh, who we'll talk about him further, but he actually uh, rationalized why Quran 582 uh, is, um, the, sets the parameters for relationships between Muslims and Jews uh, in perpetuity. The eighth slide. The eighth slide is entitled ADL Global and Regional Studies of Anti-Semitism, and essentially it's showing you the 11 stereotypes that the ADL queries to those uh, that it is surveying, um, and it asks them simply uh, if they agree with these stereotypes, and, and they're, they're quite... Um, traditional, uh, have to do with uh, Jews having too much control over governments, in this case the United States government, over the media, talking too much about the Holocaust, and interestingly, uh, being responsible for most of the world's wars, uh, which, which one could argue uh, actually has a, has a motif in the Quran itself. Uh, the fifth surah, 64th verse, speaks of the Jews as uh, sowers of, of corruption and, and, and discord. But at any rate, what the ADL does uh, is determines agreement with at least six out of these 11 anti-Semitic stereotypes to define a case of what they call extreme anti-Semitism. So, um, in a sense, this is a very specific instrument, um, but it's, it's not particularly sensitive. Um, on the other hand, it is, it is a very useful instrument applied worldwide now by the ADL to capture the prevalence of extreme anti-Semitism. This is now the ninth slide. So these ADL data highlight the striking excess prevalence of extreme anti-Semitism amongst Muslims versus non-Muslims, both globally and then in some of the regional surveys that the ADL uh, has has conducted since since 2014. So basically 2014 through 2017. Overall, you see that there's an excess, two to fourfold uh, excess of Muslim Jew hatred relative to any other major religious affiliation or atheism. And this association with Islam persisted within the Muslim diaspora populations of Western Europe and the United States. Indeed, the world's 16 most anti-Semitic countries were all in the Muslim Middle East, where a rather striking 74% to 93% exhibited this extreme anti-Semitism. Uh, the prevalence of extreme anti-Semitism globally by religious affiliation was Muslims, 49%, Christians, 24%, uh, those professing no religion, 21%, Hindus, 19%, Buddhists, 17%. And these were the data in tabular form that, that Mort Klein had held up uh, during that congressional hearing uh, back on April, April 9th. In Western Europe, the overall prevalence of extreme anti-Semitism within the Muslim communities was between 49% to 68% versus 12% to 29% amongst non-Muslims with a two to 4.5 fold uh, uh, excess in individual countries observed. In the United States, the last country to, to be surveyed uh, and where this questionnaire was administered, the prevalence of extreme anti-Semitism was 34% within the Muslim community versus 14% of the general population. Once again, a 2.4-fold uh, excess. So actually quite consistent with the data that the ADL has compiled from around the world. 
This is the tenth slide. The, t the title of this slide, slide is Koran 929, Jihad, War, Sharia, and Jew Infidel Hatred. And it's one in a series of three slides. And what I'm demonstrating here was that the central Quranic verse, a central jihad verse of the Quran, actually defines relationships between Muslims and non-Muslims. Uh, the verse itself reads as follows, quote, fight against those who believe in not in Allah, nor in the last day, nor forbid that which, that which has been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, and those who acknowledge not the religion of truth, i.e. Islam, among the people of the scripture, Jews and Christians, and also included our Zoroastrians, until they pay the jizya, the Quranic poll tax, with willing submission and feel themselves uh, uh, subdued. Now, the jizya tax that is really, etymologically, the tax paid in lieu of being slain by a resumption of the jihad, and it's been traditionally accompanied, or was traditionally accompanied, by humiliating rituals, mock beheadings uh, and, and blows, etc., and also um, the positioning of a, of a lead seal uh, around, uh, around the neck of, of the dhimmi, uh, the submitted infidel, uh, and the word dimmi coming from the, uh, the, the pact of submission, or dimma. Uh, the, the seal was placed there to show payment, but another form of humili humil humiliation. The modern come classical gloss on Quran 929 that I will we'll provide uh, is by the most esteemed Shiite theologian of the contemporary era, Muhammad Hussein Tabatabai, who died in 1981. Tabatabai was author of uh, Al-Mizan Fi Tafsir Al-Quran, which has this very flowery title, the, tra the Measure of Balance, Justly Held Scales in the Interpretation of the Quran. It's a 21-volume Arabic opus, which is regarded as the most important contemporary Sh uh, Shiite Quranic commentary, it is the mainstream Islamic Studies Academy, both Western and Iranian, who've, who have actually designated Tabatabai the leading modern Shiite uh, scholar and philosopher, even coining a neologism for him and, and dubbing him a theosopher. So he's not, just, he's not just a theologian, he's not just a philosopher, he was not just a philosopher. Um, no, indeed, he was a theosopher. The Alama Tabatabai University, Alama being... Uh, a title, an honorific for the most esteemed um, uh, theologian. Uh, the Alama Tabatabai University was named in honor of this celebrated Shiite authority and theosopher, um, and it is the largest specialized state social sciences university in Iran, with 17,000 students and 500 full-time uh, faculty members. This is the 11th slide. The second in our series, Quran 929, Jihad, War, Sharia, and Jew Infidel Hatred. And uh, I found a very interesting uh, announcement from May 3rd, 2012, so about 30 years after Taba Tabai uh, had passed. Um, and it, it was a, about a conference uh, dedicated to recognizing the interpretative methods and principles used by Alama Taba Tabai uh, in, his, in his exorcist, in his Quranic commentary. Uh, and the announcement of this conference was posted, uh, interestingly, by uh, a website that proudly dubs itself, quote, the, and the caps are in the original, cultural website of martyrdom and sacrifice. And it's important to point out that unlike so-called radicals, going back to Ayatollah Khomeini, his successor Ayatollah Khamenei, um, again, Taba Tabai is considered the paragon of mainstream uh, Shiite orthodoxy, uh, and, and not a radical, decidedly not a radical. This is the 12th slide. Uh, third of Quran 929, Jihad War, Sharia, and Jew Infidel Hatred. Um, and what I've included here is Taba Tabai's gloss on Quran 929, again, from this uh, most authoritative uh, Shiite Quranic commentary. Uh, and here is the concluding summary, but essentially it reemphasizes uh, this overarching principle. Jews and Christians and Zoroastrians, script scriptuaries or, or people of the book, must be fought, subdued, and humbled 
because they constitute a chronic danger to an Islamic Sharia-based society and its mores. And here is the quotation from Tabitha Bai's gloss. Quote, regarding their characteristics that necessitate fighting them, as mentioned in the beginning of the verse, um, followed by them giving the jizya, the Quranic poll tax, to uphold their protection, again from renewal of the jihad war against them, it informs us that the purpose of humiliating them is their submission to an Islamic lifestyle and to a righteous religious government within an Islamic society. They shall not be equal to Muslims, nor stand out against them as an independent entity, free to express anything their souls feel like, nor to publicize the doctrines and activities invented by their lunacies that corrupt human societies. This all relates to them handing over money from their hands out of a contemptible position. So the meaning of the verse, and Allah knows best, is fight the people of the book who do not truly believe in Allah or in the last day with a faith that is acceptable and uncorrupted from being proper and who do not forbid what is forbidden in Islam, namely those crimes that when committed cor uh, corrupt human society and who do not abide by a religion that conforms with the divine creation. Fight them and persist in fighting them until they are humbled among you and submit to your rule. This is the 13th slide. So what were the consequences and the, the practical impact of the whole body of regulations that emerged from this uh, uh, Quranic verse and the principles uh, it embodied. And this is what generated uh, what the historian Batya Orr has called uh, dimitude, or, or, or the, the parallel subservient civilization that evolved under the Sharia and the application um, of, of, the, of, the, of the Dhimma Pact and its attendant regulations. Uh, under both Sunni and Shiite, Shiite rule. So this is from a, a, a manual of um, Persian Islamic law, the, the Jami Abbasi of al -Amili. It was instituted under Shah Abbas, who, who reigned from 1588 to 1629, and administered in some measure until 1925. And I'm going to quickly read you these 12 points. One, Jews are not permitted to dress like, to dress like Muslims. A Jew must exhibit a yellow or red badge of dishonor on his chest. A Jew is not permitted to ride on a horse. When riding on an ass, he must hang both legs on one side. He is not entitled to bear arms. On the street and in the market, he must pass stealthily from a corner or from the side. Jewish women are not permitted to cover their faces, um, which, which means that they're essentially uh, to be treated almost like whores. Um, the Jew is restricted from establishing boundaries of private property. A Jew who becomes a Muslim is forbidden to return to Judaism. Uh, upon disclosure of a disagreement between a Jew and Muslim, the Jew's argument has no merit. In Muslim cities, the Jew is forbidden to build a synagogue. A Jew is not entitled to have his house built higher than a Muslim's. This is the 14th slide. So what, what was the practical impact of, of this system of dimitude under Shiite and Sunni rule, the practical impact of Quran 929. Uh, traveler historian Israel Joseph Benjamin, an, an itinerant rabbi uh, who died in 1864, uh, traveled extensively through the Islamic world in the mid-19th uh, century, uh, and he chronicled um, some of the oppression suffered by Persian Jews uh, during this mid-19th century period, and I'm going to read through these quickly. Throughout, the Jew, throughout Persia, the Jews are obliged to live in a part of town separated from the other inhabitants, for they are considered as unclean creatures who bring contamination with their intercourse and presence. This and the following re regulation, for the same reason, they are forbidden to go out when it rains, for it is said the rain would wash dirt off them, which would sully the feet of the Muslims, the Muslims. So these two regulations that he observed are consistent with the application of, of najis, the, the, the more literal interpretation of verses like Quran 928 that suggest the, the impurity of the infidel. Uh, spiritual and physical, but, but the Shia w w applied this to, to, the, to the physical realm as well. Uh, this is the 
the third in the series of these oppressions that, that uh, Benjamin observed. If a Jew is recognized as such in the streets, he is subjected to the greatest of insults. The passers-by spit in his face and sometimes beat him so unmercifully that he falls to the ground and is obliged to be, and is obliged to be carried home. If a Persian kills a Jew and the family of the deceased can bring forward two, two Muslims as witness, witnesses to the fact, the murderer is punished by a fine of rough, roughly 600 piastres. But if two such witnesses cannot be produced, the crime remains unpunished, even though it has been publicly committed and is well known. Upon the least dispute between a Jew and a Persian, the former is immediately dragged before the Achun, the, the, the Muslim cleric. And if the complainant can bring forward two witnesses, the Jew is condemned to pay a heavy fine. If he is too, too poor to pay this penalty in money, he must, he must pay it in his, in his person. He is stripped to the waist, bound to a stake, and receives 40 blows with a stick. Should the sufferer utter the least cry of pain during this proceeding, the blows already given are not counted, and the punishment is begun afresh. A Jew who travels in Persia is taxed in every inn and every caravanserai he enters. If he hesitates to satisfy any demands that may happen to be made on him, they fall upon him and maltreat him until he yields to their terms. If a Jew shows himself in the street during the three days of, of Katel or Muharram, the feast of mourning for the death of, of Ali, he is sure to be murdered. Daily and hourly, new suspicions are raised against the Jews in order to obtain excuses for fresh extortion. The desire of gain is always the chief incitement to fanaticism. So those are uh, uh, Benjamin's observations about the, the plight of Persian Jewry. The 15th slide. Um, and now we'll move to the practical impact of Quran 929 and the whole body of regulations, uh, uh, the, 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 the system of dimitude, as applied uh, in an example of Sunni rule. And, and this, is, this is quite poignant because it's dealing with the Jews' indigenous homeland, historical Palestine. Um, so this is what Benjamin observed in the mid-19th century during his, his, his uh, sojourn in, 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 in Palestine. And he sums it up by saying, deep misery and continual oppression are the right words to describe the condition of the children of Israel in the land of their fathers. And he then goes on to list five uh, particularly uh, striking observations. They are entirely destitute of every legal protection and every means of safety. It is only the European consuls who frequently take care of the oppressed and afford them some protection. With unheard of rapacity, tax upon tax is levied on them, and with the exception of Jerusalem, the taxes demanded are arbitrary. Whole communities have been impoverished by the exorbitant claims of the sheikhs, who, under the most trifling pretenses and without uh, being subject to any control, oppress the Jews with fresh, fresh burdens. In the strict sense of the word, the Jews are not even masters of their own property. They, they do not even venture to complain when they are robbed and plundered. Their lives are taken into as little consideration as their property. They are exposed to the caprice of anyone, even the smallest pretext, even a harmless discussion, a word dropped in conversation is enough to cause bloody reprisals. Violence of every kind is of daily occurrence. The chief evidence of their miserable condition is the universal poverty which we remarked in Palestine and which is here truly astounding. It even causes leprosy among the Jews of Palestine as in former times. Robbed of their means of subsistence, from the cultivation of the soil and the pursuit of trade, they exist upon the charity of their brethren in the faith in foreign part. The Arab tramples this sacred soil beneath his feet and considers the Jew a disinherited and accursed being. It's actually quite remarkable that Benjamin uh, traveled uh, throughout the U.S., the United States, um, in 1859 to, to 1862, uh, when the U.S. was still a devoutly Christian society, um, it's, it's worth noting. Um, and, and the striking contrast he observed when he, and when he wrote of um, American Jews uh, and Judaism, uh, the following uh, extracts from, from his travels in the United States. Quote, the magnificent institutions it, Judaism, Ju Jews, Judaism, has called into life the great congregations, the variety of religious viewpoints that are expressed with neighborly patience, 
and the greatest freedom. And he adds, every office was open to all without distinction of religion or birth. Uh, so that, quote, the Israelites were represented in all the municipal and state offices and were members of Congress. Slide 16. Uh, this is a slide entitled Ex Mufti of, of Jerusalem, Hajimin el Hosani, who died in 1974, Jihadism and Islamic Jew hatred. Uh, el Hosani composed a fatwa in 1937 that translates as Islam and the Jews. And once again, it rivets upon Quran 582 and concludes with Muhammad's apocalyptic hadith uh, from Sahih Muslim, book 41, number 6985. Uh, as part of it, of uh, an invocation to destroy Palestinian Jewry, at minimum, if not extending beyond Palestine, uh, by jihad. So I'll talk a little more about this hadith, but it is um, it is essentially the uh, words that Muhammad utters to usher in the Messianic age, and it talks of of uh, of uh, the rocks and trees will cry out, uh, and the Jews would be exposed, and the Muslims uh, would would kill them. This same hadith was incorporated into the Hamas Charter, Article 7, in, in 1988, so roughly 50 years later. Um, interestingly, in 2011, face-to-face uh, -face Arabic interview polling data of 1,010 Muslims from Gaza and Judea Samaria um, was obtained by Clinton pollster uh, Stanley Greenberg, and it indicated that 73% of this sample uh, abided the, the dictates of this annihilationist hadith, while 80% wanted Israel as a political entity destroyed uh, by jihad, uh, by jihad war, um, and that's very consistent with Article 15 of the Hamas Charter. Getting back to El Hosseini's fatwa itself, there are zero references to Nazism or any other non-Islamic sources of Jew hatred, um, and if we note, even further back in 1918, uh, so this is before uh, Hitler has been uh, imprisoned for the beer hall putsch and writes uh, Mein Kampf. So this is 1918. This is, um, El Husseini declares, quote, the Zionists will be massacred to the last man. So he was an annihilationist uh, Jew hater uh, even before the rise of Nazism altogether. Um, again, getting back to the to the fatwa itself, uh, if you look at it, it contains ten specific Quranic references, two explicit citations of Sirah, the, these early earliest Muslim pious Muslim biographies of Muhammad, and two major explicit references uh, to Hadith, this apocalyptic Hadith, but also another Hadith, which um, talks of the conspiratorial uh, poisoning of of Muhammad. Uh, this is sort of a, a, a Quranic continuation of the theme of Jews as, as, as prophet killers. The fatwa itself, this 1937 fatwa, was distributed by the Nazis uh, verbatim uh, to, to Muslim SS units in the Balkans and Soviet Russia. And I have some lingering questions. My, again, this is published in, in 1937. My 2013 monograph was the first fully annotated English translation. Why? Why did it, why did it take so long? Uh, further, uh, in 2006, uh, declassified U.S. intel files on Hajimin el Hassani provide further confirmation that he was a jihadist uh, who sought the reestablishment of a global caliphate. And, it, and why hasn't this uh, been emphasized? Slide 17. Um, I've illustrated here an, an extract uh, from two fatwas that were issued uh, in January of 1956 from Sunni Islam's Vatican equivalent, Al-Azhar University, and they reaffirmed Hajimin al husanis jihadism and Islamic Jew hatred, again coming from um, this pinnacle of uh, Sunni Islamic religious uh, education. They were even noticed, um, as I point out, uh, by the U.S. press, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, uh, January uh, uh, 11th, 1956, uh, published a, a lead story uh, entitled Peace with Israel Sacrilegious, Say Leaders of Muslims. Um, the Chicago Trib, uh, 
back further in the paper on January 11th, 1956, page 24, uh, quote, Muslims say peace with Israel uh, would be sacrilegious, was the headline in the Chicago Tribune. If, if we look at the language uh, in these overlapping fatwas, I've summarized the key uh, extracts. Also, uh, it's, a, it's worth noting that this is, this is some nine to ten months before the 1956 Sinai War breaks, breaks out. So this was not written in the midst of a conflagration. Quote, Muslims cannot conclude peace with those Jews who have usurped the territory of Palestine and attacked its people and their property in any manner which allows the Jews to continue as a state in that sacred Muslim territory, as Jews have taken a part of Palestine and there established their non-Islamic government and have also evacuated from that part of most, most of its Muslim inhabitants, Jihad to restore the country to its people is the duty of all Muslims, not just those who can undertake it. And since all Islamic countries constitute the abode of every Muslim, the jihad is imperative for both the Muslims inhabiting the territory attacked and Muslims everywhere else, because even though some sections have not been attacked directly, the attack nevertheless took place on a part of the Muslim territory, which is a legitimate residence for any Muslim. Everyone knows that from the early days of Islam to the present day, the Jews have been plotting against Islam and Muslims and the Islamic homeland. They do not propose to be content with the attack they made on Palestine and Al-Aqsa Mosque, but they plan for the possession of all Islamic territories from the Nile to the Euphrates. So you see, these tropes are not unique to so-called radical elements of the Arab Muslim world. This is coming from, again, Sunni Islam's Vatican equivalent, and it's redolent with conspiratorial Jew hatred, um, with uh, rather bizarre claims about uh, territorial designs, etc. Et uh, and it's also, ta uh, you know, candidly admitting that it doesn't matter if it's only a section of, of Palestine uh, that where the Jews are um, uh, applying law that that is that that abrogates the Sharia. It doesn't matter. That's not acceptable either. This is slide 18. And now I want to uh, get into Muhammad Sayyid Tantawi, who was the uh, not the current Grand Imam, but his immediate predecessor. Uh, Tantawi died in 2010. Um, and I want to talk about his uh, authoritative modern Quranic comp uh, on the Jews, um, and also the fact uh, that he was one of the leading uh, uh, Sunni uh, Quranic commentators of the modern era. So he served as Al Azhar University Grand Imam, again, Sunni Islam's papal equivalent, from 1996 to 2010. He was a leading modern Sunni Quranic commentator who edited a full 15 volume Quranic commentary. He also helped establish the largest online resource for Quranic interpretation uh, called altafsir.com, which has published approximately 100 full-text, verse-by-verse searchable classical and modern commentaries on the Quran, in, including his own. Um, and they span um, uh, over a thousand years uh, from, from, the, from the 8th century to, to the current era, to, to living Quranic commentators uh, at this website. So it's a, it's a remarkable tool that he develop, helped develop. Um, earlier, as a, a, for his PhD, uh, uh, actually, he wrote a 700-page-plus treatise um, which translates as Jews in the Quran uh, and Traditions. Um, and I think um, sh uh, having you read here this uh, extract from Jews in the Quran and the Traditions, I think it's appropriate to, to call it a modern Quranic conf. Uh, this is a this is a very typical summary extract uh, from from uh, Tantawi's PhD thesis. Quote: The Quran describes the Jews with their own particular degenerate characteristics, i.e., killing the prophets of Allah. That's Quran 261:3:112. Corrupting his words by putting them in the wrong places, consuming the people's wealth frivolously. That's Quran 4161. Refusal to distance themselves from the evil they do, Quran 3120, 579, and other ugly characteristics caused by their deep-rooted lascivious envy, Quran 2109. Only minority of the Jews keep their word. All Jews are not the same. The good ones become Muslims, Quran 3113. The bad ones do not. 
the Jews always remain, uh, always remain maleficent deniers. They should desist from their negative denial. Some Jews went way overboard in their denying hostility. So gentle persuasion can do no good with them. So use force with them and treat them in the way as you see effective in ridding them of their evil. One may go so far as to ban their religion, their persons, their wealth, and their villages, unquote. Uh, so these, these fuller Quranic litanies uh, have been published um, actually going back uh, 50 years from Al-Azhar University. Uh, you, can find, you can find a couple of interesting ones from 1968. Um, but a more recent one was published in 2004 uh, by Tantawi's Al-Azhar uh, colleague and then head of the religious uh, uh, edict or fatwa committee or former head of that uh, Sheikh Sakar, and it was simply entitled in English, The Jews' 20 Bad Traits, as described in the Quran. Slide 19. Um, so, uh, uh, this slide emphasizes that uh, one could argue that perhaps his PhD thesis, Tantawi's PhD thesis, was a less mature work, but that certainly cannot be said of his full 15 volume Quranic commentary. Um, and that commentary includes a gloss on Quran 560, which is the Jews as apes and pigs verse. Um, and it condemns in broad terms, quote, the corrupt thinking and false assumptions and claims of the Jews, unquote, and further maintains generally, quote, what you, the Jews, claim is even more evil, as shown in the penalty that has befallen you, as you have been cursed and become estranged from Allah's mercy and compassion, and what has befallen your ancestors, of whom some were transformed into apes, others into pigs. As during his tenure as Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, uh, Tantawi issued a, a hostile statement on interfaith dialogue uh, just after he met with Israel's chief rabbi, Israel Mayor Lau, in Cairo on December 15, 1997. And he included in these statements a reaffirmation of the views he expressed in his dissertation from, from the late 1960s. So by then it was about 30 years old, um, i.e. the Jews and the Quran and, and the traditions. And, and here's what he said. The prophet's stance, which is, which is my own stance as well, was that anyone who avoids meeting with the enemies in order to counter their dubious claims and stick fingers into their eyes is a coward. My stance stems from Allah's book, the Quran, more than one third of which deals with the Jews. By the way, El, El Husani gave a gave a a, um, a statement to Bosni to the Bosnian Muslim brigades in 1942, where he made the same claim, i.e., more than one third of, of the Quran dealing with the Jews. Back to Tantawi, I wrote a dissertation dealing with them, the Jews, all their false claims and their punishment by Allah. I still believe in everything written in that dissertation, unquote. Uh, apparently unmoved even after the uh, gruesome Netanya homicide bombing, uh, the Passover massacre of Jews on March 27, uh, 2002, Tantawi in April 2002 proclaimed the legitimacy of homicide bombing of Jews and condemned, again, the Jews as enemies of Allah, descendants of apes and pigs, again, per Quran 560, uh, making his personal religiously sanctioned Muslim Jew hatred eminently clear. Slide 20. Um, Ahmed Al-Tayeb is Sunni Islam's current Jew-hating papal equivalent, and this is Al-Tayeb in his own words. Um, in 2017, uh, a publication that comes out every year since, I believe, 2009, produced by a uh, so-called moderate uh, Jordanian uh, institute uh, that, was, that, that remains much involved in interfaith dialogue, but re received, uh, came to notice uh, prominently um, after uh, Pope Benedict's uh, Regensburg address, and, and they issued some um, statements about dialogue and, of course, denouncing his, his, um, his, uh, his speech at Regensburg, which um, was pretty clear about the jihad violence that had been wrought upon uh, the Christian communities during the Middle Ages. Um, so uh, he was ranked number one at, in the Muslim 500 uh, for 2017, and his Muslim 500 profile of that year stated, 
uh, influence, highest scholarly authority for the majority of Sunni Muslims, runs the foremost and largest Sunni Islamic university, i.e. al-Azhar, school of thought, traditional Sunni. Uh, during an interview he gave in 2013 on Egyptian TV, uh, October 25th, 2013, um, he explained the ongoing relevance of, of again, Quran 582, uh, which has been invoked to inspire violent Muslim hatred of Jews essentially since the advent of Islam. And notice also the open equivalence of Jews slash Zionists and Judaism Zionism. And here's what he said. A verse in the Quran 582 explains the Muslims' relations with the Jews. This is an historical perspective, which has not changed to this day. See how we suffer today from global Zionism and Judaism. Since the inception of Islam 1400 years ago, we have, we have been suffering from Jews and Zionist interference in Muslim affairs. This is a cause of great distress for the Muslims. The Quran said it, and history has proved it. Quote, again, this is a quote from 582, you shall find the strongest among men in enmity to the believers, i.e. Muslims, to be the Jews, unquote. There was no reaction to this from global leaders, religious leaders, political leaders, with the exception of Dutch PVV leader Geert Wilders. He was the only one. Uh, and not only did he denounce these statements, he urged Pope Francis to denounce them uh, uh, as well. Um, and, of course, uh, that, that, that did not happen, sadly. Um, twice, 2014-2015, uh, Al-Tayeb blamed, quote, global Zionism and its machinations for the proliferation of jihad terror in the Middle East. Uh, in January 2018, uh, he claimed bizarrely that the Zionist entity was plotting to march uh, on the Meccan Kaaba, the, the, the holy site around which you see these uh, Hajj uh, 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 pilgrims uh, circling. Um, and also, the, the, the Zionist entity was uh, supposedly going to attack the Mosque of Islam's Prophet. This is a statement he made in January 2018. Uh, during June of 2018, he further declared, quote, The issue of anti-Semitism is a lie that continues to deceive na nations uh, to this day. So there you have these statements from uh, and writings from the last two Sunni Muslim papal equivalents. The 21st slide. Uh, this begins a series of seven slides, uh, which I, I, I think are critically important to, to understand why this material uh, continues to be obfuscated, misrepresented, denied, etc. Uh, and I've called it Correcting Adoyen's Tragic Negation of Islamic Jew Hatred and Jewish Dimitude. And again, it's the first in, uh, of seven slides. Bernard Lewis, who died uh, in 2018, died last year, uh, made these oracular, uh, if frankly vacuous and counterfactual summary pronouncements across three decades. 1974, he wrote, The Dima on the whole worked well. The non-Muslims managed to thrive under Muslim rule and even to make significant contributions to Islamic civilization. The restrictions were not onerous and were usually less severe in practice than in theory. As long as the non-Muslim communities accepted and conformed to the status of tolerated subordination assigned to them, they were not troubled. 1984. In Islamic society, hostility to the Jew is non-theological. It is not related to any specific Islamic doctrine, nor to any specific circumstance in Islamic history. For Muslims, it is not part of the birth pangs of their religion, as it is for Christians. And in 2006... Dimi dash tood, uh, so it's very derisively hyphenated. Subservience and persecution and ill treatment of Jews is a myth. 22nd slide. Um, Shlomo Dov Goitain, who died in 1985, uh, unlike Lewis, was a historian who specialized in the study of Muslim non Muslim relations. Um, Goitain's seminal research findings were widely published, most notably in a monumental five-volume work, um, which was a study of this incredible trove of primary source documents, uh, the, the so-called Geniza documents, a Geniza being a synagogue's uh, storeroom. And the documents, primarily religious, also included very important secular writings, including letters. 
So Goitein was the major scholar of this um, um, very important collection of documents, and they cover um, generally the period between 950 to 1250 uh, CE. Um, so the five-volume work on these materials was called The Mediterranean Society, um, and it was published, but uh, uh, the volumes were published between 1967 and 1993. Uh, Goitein was the professor emeritus of the Hebrew University and actually a Lewis colleague while both were at the Institute for Advanced Study uh, in Princeton. Um, here is Goitein, Goitein from, his, from his original scholarship on the, on the Geniza documents, um, writing about indigenous Muslim Jew hatred, uh, Sunuth. Um, in a Mediterranean society, he observed that the Jews, quote, coined in the Geniza period, again, in the, in the, in the mid-10th to mid-13th century, the word sinuth, quote, to differentiate animosity against Jews from the discrimination practiced by Islam against non-Muslims in general. So, Jew hatred in the Jews, Muslim Jew hatred in the Jews' own uh, coined word. Um, and he then went on to, to cite how incidents of, of such specific Muslim Jew hatred uh, as, that he documented in the, in the Geniza record. Uh, it came from North Syria, Morocco, uh, and Egypt, uh, with references to, to uh, Alexandria in, in Egypt being especially frequent. Um, Goitein wrote many essays during this period based on the same materials. And in 1970, he wrote the following about the Dima Covenant or the, or the system of dimitude, the, 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 the non-Muslim dhimmis subjected to the Sharia, to under Muslim rule. Quote, an Islamic state was part of or coincided with Dar al-Islam, the house of Islam, lands conquered by jihad, in other words. Its treasury was mal al-Muslimin, the money of the Muslims. Christians and Jews were not citizens of the state, not even second-class citizens. Citizens. They were outsiders under the protection of the Muslim state, a status characterized by the term dhimma, for which protection, again, a protection from the resumption of the jihad against them, for which protection they had to pay a poll tax specific to them. They were also exposed to a great number of discriminatory and humiliating laws, as it lies in the very nature of such restrictions, soon additional humiliations were added. And before the second century uh, of Islam was out, a complete body of legislation in this matter was in existence. In times and places in which they became too oppressive, they led to the dwindling or even complete extinction of the minorities." Unquote. The 23rd slide. My research has included voluminous materials Lewis never bothered to compile, let alone analyze with comparable intellectual honesty. These careful analyses ongoing have demonstrated irrefragably that the Quran, its classical and modern exegesis by Islam's greatest commentators and the traditions of Muhammad and the nascent Muslim community are rife with virulent conspiratorial Jew-hating motifs that have been acted upon by Muslims vis-a-vis -vis Jews across space and time from the advent of Islam till now. The Quran's overall discussion of the Jews is marked by a litany of their sins and punishments as if part of a divine indictment, conviction, and punishment process. Presently, Al-Azhar Quranic litanies of 20 to 25 verses describing fixed negative traits of the Jews are popular, widely disseminated, and endorsed in the writings and public statements of this Vatican of Sunni Islam's last two papal equivalents, the late Grand Imam Tantawi, current Grand Imam al tiab and the most important modern Shiite theologian and, and philosopher, again, or theosopher, uh, Taba Dabai, who died in 1981. 24th slide. 17 times a day, pious Muslims repeat Quran 170, reminding them not to be like the Jews who have incurred Allah's anger. Now, the opening verse of the Quran, the so-called Fatiha, is composed of, of, of seven very short verses. The basic arrangement of the Quran uh, in its entirety, from, so from the, from the, uh, in the 114 uh, chapters or surahs, from the second chapter to the 114th chapter, the, the organizing principle is simply longest to shortest, which leads, as you might imagine, to the rather discursive narrative of the Quran. 
But at any rate, Quran 1-7 refers specifically uh, to, to those who've incurred Allah's anger and the classical exorcists across, um, across 13 centuries now um, is that that reference to those incurring Allah's anger uh, is, is to the Jews. Jew-hating Quranic highlights, in addition, uh, include Jews as prophet killers, updated in the Hadith to include Muhammad himself, allegedly poisoned to death by a Jewess in a Jewish conspiracy, while the Shiite Hadith further hold the Jews responsible for the deaths of Ali and his son Hussein, meriting permanent uh, debasement and humiliation, Quran 261-3-1-12. Chronically deceitful Jews uh, transformed into apes or pigs, uh, Quran 265, 560, 7166. A Quranic epithet Muhammad personally directed at the Jews. He used brothers of apes and pigs, uh, according to the seer, according to the early uh, Muslim biographies. Before the Muslims subdued, and he personally slaughtered by beheading all the post pubescent males, some 700 to 900 of the Jewish tribe Banu Qurayza. Jews as inveterate conspirators against Islam, the ancient Quranic antecedents of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, Quran 564, who harbor the greatest enmity towards the Muslim creed, Quran 582. The Jews' ultimate sin and punishment are made clear in the Quran. They are the devil's minions, Quran 451, 460. Cursed by Allah, their faces will be obliterated, Quran 447. And if they do not accept the true faith of Islam, Again, the Jews who understand their faith become Muslims, Quran 3, 1, 13. They will burn in the hellfires, and there's multiple references to this. 455, 529, 98.6, and 58, 14 uh, to 19. Slide 25. Lewis never analyzed a brilliant, scrupulously documented, 75-page, 202 uh, reference 1937 essay in French by rabbi and Islamic scholar Georges Vaida on the Hadith. Um, I was uh, very privileged, I felt, to have fully translated into English for the first time and included in, in my compendium, The Legacy of Islamic Anti-Semitism. Uh, and this, this um, r really remarkable essay uh, demonstrated the following. Stubborn malevolence is the Jews' uh, defining worldly characteristic in these traditions, in the, in the Hadith. Rejecting Muhammad and refusing to convert to Islam out of jealousy, envy, and even selfish personal interest led them to acts of treachery in keeping with their inveterate nature. Sorcery, poisoning, assass assassination held no scruples for them. These archetypes, these, these themes, sanctioned Muslim hatred towards the Jews and the admonition to at best subject the Jews to Muslim domination as dhimmis treated with contempt under certain humiliating arrangements. Sunni Muslim eschatology, so end of times theology, emphasizes the Jews' supreme hostility toward Islam. Jews are described as adherents of the Dajjal, the Muslim equivalent of the Antichrist. And per other traditions, the Dajjal is in fact Jewish. When the Dajjal is defeated, his Jewish companions will be slaughtered. Everything will deliver them up except for the so-called Garkad tree. Again, this is the Hadith that El Husseini uh, referred to in his 1937 fatwa that's in the, um, in the 1988 Hamas Covenant. It's repeated ad nauseum as Moshe Sharon lamented, uh, I believe, back in 2009, almost every Friday at, 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 at sermon time. Uh, thus, according to several canonical hadith, Muhammad himself reportedly de declared, if a Jew seeks refuge under a tree or a stone, these objects will be able to, to speak to tell a Muslim, quote, there is a Jew behind me, come and kill him. Vida also emphasizes how the notion of jihad war ransom extends into Islamic eschatology. Quote, not only are the Jews vanquished in the eschatological war, but they will serve as ransom for the Muslims in the fires of hell. The sins of certain Muslims will weigh on them like mountains, but on the day of resurrection, these sins will be lifted and laid upon the Jews. 26 slide. Lastly, a profound anti-Jewish motif, uh, anti-Jewish and racist motif, put forth in early Muslim Sunni historiography, as well as the Shiite Hadith literature, is most assuredly contra Lewis, a part of the so-called birth pangs of Islam, and that's the story of Abdullah bin Saba, an alleged renegade Yemenite Jew and per Sunnis founder of the heterodox Shiite sect. Sunnis held him responsible 
identified as a black Jew. So again, it's a racist motif as well. For promoting the Shiite heresy and fomenting the rebellion and internal strife associated with this primary breach in Islam's political innocence, culminating in the assassination of the third rightly guided Caliph uh, Uthman and the bitter lasting legacy of Sunni Shiite sectarian strife. Authoritative Shiite authors claim this identifiably black Jew was guilty of perverting and warping the message of Caliph Ali's uh, true Shiite followers. Mainstream Shiites thus designated Abdullah bin Saba as, as an avatar of extreme heretical beliefs for which Caliph Ali purportedly had Ibn Saba burned alive, as, des as described in, in, in Shiite hadith. 27th slide. So, in summary, the entirety of this ugly Islamic doctrine, shared with minimal variation by Sunni and Shiite al uh, Islam alike, begot chronic grinding oppression, interspersed with paroxysms of violence, including sporadic mass murderous pogroms, which affected Jewish communities in Palestine, Yemen, Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Morocco, and even mythically tolerant Muslim Spain to the west, as well as Turkey to the north, and Iraq and Iran to the east. Modern Zionism, culminating in the reestablishment of Israel, governed by Jews fully liberated from 13 centuries of jihad-imposed dimitude in their ancestral homeland, has reinvigorated Islam's annihilationist strains of Jew hatred. Very interesting uh, review of, of the legacy of Islamic anti-Semitism. My compendium was written by historian Robert E. Kaplan, who's um, a Cornell-educated historian and uh, has taught in Israel, um, and whose real expertise is, is in, is in uh, anti-Semitism generally, but particularly European anti-Semitism. Um, this remarkable review documented four generalizations Bernard Lewis employed to negate Islamic anti-Semitism, uh, which, as Kaplan wrote, quote, crumble under the slightest scrutiny. And, and these, these are Kaplan's uh, summary observations. The least onerous version of, mu of Muslim oppression is typical of Muslim practice. The worst behavior of, of Christians towards Jews was the norm that Muslim abuses were far less bad than the worst imaginable abuses by non-Muslims, ascribing to human nature rather than Islam, with no basis of evidence, the unattractive characteristics exhibited by Muslims. So again, these are, these are the generalizations Kaplan observed uh, Lewis employing to negate Islamic anti-Semitism. But Kaplan further identified Lewis's cynical manipulation of semantics. Quoting Kaplan, had as Lewis reached the conclusion that anti-Semitism is unknown to classical Islam, he defines anti-Semitism as hatred of Jews according to Christian doctrine, not simply hatred of Jews. In doing so, he distorts the ordinary meaning of anti-Semitism, which in contemporary English means hatred of Jews. And uh, I've added a postscript uh, on on these uh, observations, which occurred during the discussion section uh, of, of my presentation um, on July 30th, uh, 2019 at the ZOA. Um, and it's a revelation that, that Mort Klein um, courageously made public. Um, and it has to do with uh, Lewis's um, um, being enamored in, uh, of the Oslo process and being really an Oslo enforcer. Um, which uh, may strike some people as odd that he even would abide the Oslo process. But at any rate, when you, when you begin to see this apologetic that I've, that I've outlined, um, it, it, it actually becomes quite understandable. And it, um, so ZOA President Mort Klein revealed that within six months after the signing of the 1993 Oslo Accords, which Professor Lewis vociferously championed, Mr. Klein received a threatening phone call from the good professor that Klein ZOA must stop chronicling and reporting the Arafat-led Palestinian Muslim regime's violation of the accords, which of course ultimately included incitement of and participation in acts of murderous jihad violence against Israeli Jews. So I add that as a postscript to the discussion. The 29th slide. Um, I've called 
uh, these two following slides, uh, the 29th and the 30th, removing anti-Semitism from the minbar, which uh, comes from um, a, a, a very interesting essay collection um, uh, called Removing Anti-Semitism from, from the uh, Pulpit about the Vatican II Nostra Tate uh, process. And um, so I've ca called these two slides, Removing Anti-Semitism from the Minbar, Non-Muslims Must Demand Vatican II Mea Culpa-Based Reforms of Canonical Islam. Uh, the photo to the left is a minbar of the ha Muhammad Ali Mosque, Cairo, Egypt, showing the typical design with um, an ascending staircase from w and then at the top of which uh, there's some sort of platform from which the imam, the the the, the, the cleric, speaks and, and gives the gives the uh, sermon on on Fridays. Um, the middle illustration is Synagoga and Ecclesia 2015. Uh, this was a beautiful sculpture um, uh, created by artist Joshua Kaufman, commemorating the 50th anniversary of Nostra Aetate, the Second Vatican Council Declaration on the relationship of the Church to non-Christian religion, in particular uh, Judaism. And Pope Vance, uh, Francis visited, uh, actually made an unscheduled visit, to the campus of St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia, September 27th, to, to view the sculpture. And to the right is a typic, is a is Ecclesia and Synagoga uh, circa the, the 13th to 14th century, um, at which Kaufman's work was essentially answering, um, uh, and, and that's why it was called Synagoga and Ecclesia in our time. Uh, Kaufman's work depicts a female figure representing the church, sitting next to the uh, uh, other female figure representing the synagogue, each holding uh, their scriptures, which they appear to be discussing, so it's 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 symbolic of equality. Um, it is a, it is meant to oppose centuries of art in which the triumphal Christian ecclesia stood wearing a crown, while a woman representing synagogue stood blindfolded and drooping, cradling a broken lance in one arm, which is likely an allusion to the lance that pierced uh, Jesus Christ, um, while tablets of the Torah appeared to be slipping uh, from her opposite hand. The thirtieth slide. Vatican II Nostra Aetate, uh, as illustrated by a sentence from the pronouncement uh, itself, issued October 28, 1965, unambiguously condemned anti-Semitism from the Church's perspe perspective. It, it couldn't be clearer in, in the language. Quote, Moreover, mindful of her common patrimony with the Jews and motivated by the gospel's spiritual love, and by no political considerations, she, the Church, deplores the hatred, persecution, and displays of anti-Semitism directed against the Jews at any time and from any source. Furthermore, Catholic theologian uh, John Polakowski observed again in that essay collection I, I mentioned, removing anti-Semitism uh, from the pulpit, that these noble ideals articulated uh, in uh, 30 years earlier uh, in, in October of 1965, um, in, the, in the pronouncement, were only advanced when the Vatican Council did concrete things. Uh, at, quoting Polakowski, uh, formally launched the process of uprooting the classic theology of Jewish displacement from the covenant in light of the Christ event and replaced it with a theological work based on the notion of ongoing validity of the Jewish covenant to which Christians have been joined. And, and Polakowski went on to talk about a cleaning phase in this process um, that involved, quote, the removal from mainline Christian educational texts of the charge that Jews collectively were responsible for the death of Jesus, that the Pharisees were the arch enemies of Jesus and, spirit, and spiritually soulless, that Jews had been displaced by Christians in this covenantal relationship with God as a result of a refusal to accept Jesus as the Messiah, that the Old Testament was totally inferior to the New, and that Jewish faith was rooted in legalism while the Christian religion was based on grace. So these, these educational texts had such themes removed, and, and, and it was noted that they had been mainline Christian educational texts. Um, finally, by 1995, uh, current St. Joseph's uh, University professor Philip Cunningham, um, who wrote a very, um, very elegant uh, study called Education for Shalom, uh, Religion Textbooks and the Enhancement of the Catholic-Jewish Relationship, um, had noted by, by then, by 1995, that the elements of the patristic, the Church Fathers' anti-Judaic theology system, 
had pretty much been eliminated uh, from, from the textbooks by 1995. A couple of concluding uh, observations uh, riveting upon um, the great scholar Moshe Perlman. Uh, this is the 31st slide. Um, Moshe Perlman died in 2001. As a matter of fact, about, I think it was four days before 9-11. He was a scholar par excellence uh, of Islam's medieval uh, anti-Jewish polemic, uh, especially within mythically tolerant Muslim Spain. Um, I recently got a, a hold of his 1940 PhD thesis. Um, I, had, I had read many of his uh, really brilliant essays about the Muslim uh, uh, Jewish polemic of the Middle Ages, and his PhD thesis laid the groundwork for, for those, those, uh, those later studies. Um, the, again, it's a 1940 PhD thesis entitled A Study of Muslim Polemics Directed Against Jews, and it contained a chapter, The Jews in the Quran and the Traditions. Now, that's strikingly similar to um, the name of, Tan, of Tantawi's uh, 1968 uh, thesis, uh, when translated into English. Um, and it's strikingly concordant in terms of its conclusions from a completely um, opposite perspective, i.e. That, that of a Jewish scholar. Um, and here's, here's some quotes uh, from Perlman's PhD thesis, this chapter specifically, uh, about Jews in the Quran. Quote, forgetting the divine dispensation, the Jews transgressed uh, God's commandments, Allah's commandments, and flouted the prophets and even slew them, Quran 3.181. Therefore, many punishments fell upon them. He cites Quran 2.61. E.g., some of them were turned into apes for desecrating the Sabbath. Quran 2.65.7.166. Muhammad came to confirm their scriptures. Quran 3.3.4.51. But they did not accept him. They concealed the revelation. Quran 2.42.3.71. Or did not understand it. Quran 2.78. They tried to mislead people. Quran 3.69.3.99 having no compunction about deceiving the pagan Arabs, Quran 369. Therefore, although they knew from their books all about Muhammad as, as they knew their own children, Quran 2146, they made false statements about the scriptures, Quran 451, 549, distorting the text. In, in contradiction to them, the prophet Muhammad declares that Ibrahim, Abraham, and Ismail, Ishmael, were Muslim prophets, uh, Quran 2, 124, 367, 368. Uh, as a matter of fact, Quran 367 specifically says that um, uh, Abraham was neither a Jew nor a Christian, he was a Muslim. Um, continuing from uh, 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 Perlman's statement, um, so Ibrahim and Ishmael were Muslim prophets who built the Meccan temple, Quran 2, 125, 397, before the revelation of Musa, Moses to which the Jews refer. Thus, Islam is the original revelation. This cuts the ground from under the feet of the unbelievers. They make blasphemous statement that Allah's hand is chained up, Quran 564, the Quranic protocols, that, that Uzair, Ezra, is the son of God, Quran 930. At the same time, they are stubborn in their opposition to the true prophet, Muhammad. They must be regarded as enemies, Quran 328, 551, 557. The believers will find that they are the fiercest enemies, the Christians being much more friendly. That's Quran 582. Therefore, after they had rejected many, many friendly overtures, Quran 259, 581, it was decided that they must be fought against, made tributaries, and compelled to pay the poll tax as a mark of their humiliation, Quran 929. In the Fatiha, really the seventh verse, Quran 17, the words... Uh, al Magdub al Ahim, those who incurred Allah's anger are supposed to refer to the Jews. Then, an extract from uh, Perlman's section uh, on the traditions quote, Persisting in their obduracy, they did not shrink from plotting, practicing sorcery, and poisoning until they were finally crushed and driven out of Arabia. The Jews extended their hatred of the Prophet Muhammad to all Muslims. They mispronounced the usual, Peace be unto you, so that it came to mean poison be upon you. For which, for which reason it is wiser and safely, safer to reply with a mere, the same to you. They always try to trick the unsuspecting Muslim. To imitate them is positively forbid, forbidden. They became, in a way, the incarnation of evil. No wonder that when the world comes to an end, and when Dajjal, the Muslim Antichrist, threatens to destroy those of the true faith, Islam, 
The Jews will be betrayed in their hiding places, even by the crying of the rock, here is a Jew behind me, kill him. Finally, uh, Perlman wrote very simply in, in 1964, quote, The Quran, of course, became a mine of anti-Jewish passages. The Hadith did not lag behind. Popular preachers used and embellished such material. And I included uh, two references uh, to his appointments at Harvard. Uh, one, this was published in the Boston Globe, October 13, 1955. Um, and then his appointment uh, later on at, at UCLA, uh, where, he re where, he, where he retired from, uh, uh, in the Los Angeles Times, published uh, November 11th, uh, 1962. So um, he, was a, he was a major uh, a academic. Uh, in the discussion, I, I've included two slides uh, that were shown during the discussion. This, this current slide is slide 33. Um, and uh, some uh, issue came up I wanted to raise about the, the striking concordance between Christian persecution, extreme anti-Semitism, and desire for strict application of the Sharia. In other words, to contextualize uh, the Islamic anti-Semitism, really, in a sense, going back to Quran 929, but regardless, as, as, as being uh, a phenomenon that really should not be viewed in, in, in isolation, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, uh, jihad hatred and and um, the um, the uh, imposition of Islamic law on on all non-Muslims. So I showed this slide. This is slide 34 uh, about the striking concordance between uh, Christian persecution, extreme anti-Semitism, and desire for strict application of the Sharia. Uh, referring to three um, surveys, indices. Uh, Open Doors uh, publishes a Christian persecution uh, yearly, uh, and it quantified, uh, it does each year, um, quantifies various expressions of persecution, including violent persecution in five areas of, Christ of a Christian's life, private, family, community, national, and church life. The ADL regional and uh, uh, global studies, which I referred to, um, in, in the main part of the lecture. Um, and again, that determined the prevalence of agreement with at least six out of 11 anti-Semitic stereotypes. And then Pew Global Data, uh, which asked a question about the, about the desire for strict, and the word was strict, application of the Sharia. And these surveys uh, worldwide, really, were, were conducted over a period of about four years between 2008 uh, and, and, and 2012. So again, the, the, the Christian persecution data are 2019 data, the anti-Semitism data from the um, ADL or, or surveys conducted between 2014 and 2017, and the Pew data on desire for strict application of the Sharia are from surveys conducted between 2008 and, two, uh, and 2012. And the Pew data were collected from 40 countries and involved 39,000 face-to-face interviews with Muslims from Europe, Asia, the Middle East, and Africa between 2008 and 2012. And the last slide, the 35th slide, is just tabulating the striking concordance between Christian persecution, extreme anti-Semitism, and desire for strict application of the Sharia. Uh, the columns are Muslim nation, Christian persecution, um, is the next column, extreme anti-Semitism is the next column, and the last column is, is w desire or want for strict application of the Sharia. And where we have the full data, it, it is quite remarkable, uh, first of all, that um, the, the concordance between, between these, these, um, these, these three uh, phenomena, Christian persecution, extreme anti-Semitism, and strict application of the Sharia, but again, also, um, if you move down to the table where data are missing, I didn't have data for extreme anti-Semitism and or application of the Sharia. Um, and first of all, if you, if you extrapolate the missing data, uh, I don't think you're going to find any more discordances. Um, but, 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 the, but the most important column, because it's, it's, it's active persecution, um, shows you how, how extraordinarily um, uh, overwhelming the the uh, rel the relationship is between uh, Islam and Christian persecution. The the 
top 50 persecutors worldwide, 80 to 85 percent of them are, are either Muslim nations or have existing within them uh, pluralities, large, large pluralities of, of Muslim populations that persecute Christians. Thank you very much.